This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L I B R I V O X dot O R G. Recording by Christy Nowak. The Jolly Miller from Mother Goose in Prose by Frank L. Baum. There was a jolly miller, lived on the river Dee, he sang and worked from morn till night, no lark so blithe as he, and this the burden of his song for ever seemed to be, I care for nobody, no, not I, since nobody cares for me. Creakity crook crick, creakity crook crick, sang out the big wheel of the mill upon the river Dee for it was old and rickety, and had worked many years grinding corn for the miller. So from morn till night it creaked and growled and complained, as if rebelling against the work it must do. And the country people, at work in the fields far away, would raise their heads when the soft summer breezes wafted the sound of the wheel to their ears, and say, The jolly miller is grinding his corn. And again, at times, when the mill was shut down and no sound of the wheel reached them, they said to one another, the jolly miller has no corn to grind today, or the miller is oiling the great wheel. But they would miss the creaking, monotonous noise, and feel more content when the mill started again and made music for them as they worked. But no one came to the mill unless they brought corn to grind, for the miller was a queer man and liked to be alone. When people passed by the mill and saw the miller at his work, they only nodded their heads, for they knew he would not reply if they spoke to him. He was not an old man, nor a sour man, nor a bad man. On the contrary, he could be heard singing at his work most of the time. But the words of his song would alone have kept people away from him, for they were always these. I care for nobody, no, not I, since nobody cares for me. He lived all alone in the mill-house, cooking his own meals and making his own bed, and neither asking nor receiving help from anyone. It is very certain that if the jolly miller had cared to have friends, many would have visited him, since the country people were sociable enough in their way. But it was the miller himself who refused to make friends, and old Farmer Dobson used to say, The reason nobody cares for the miller is because he won't let them. It is the fault of the man himself, not the fault of the people. However this may have been, it is true the miller had no friends, and equally sure that he cared to have none, for it did not make him a bit unhappy. Sometimes, indeed, as he sat at evening in the doorway of the mill and watched the moon rise in the sky, he grew a bit lonely and thoughtful, and found himself longing for someone to love and cherish, for this is the nature of all good men. But when he realized how his thoughts were straying, he began to sing again, and drove away all such hopeless longings. At last a change came over the miller's life. He was standing one evening beside the river, watching the moonbeams play upon the water, when something came floating down the stream that attracted his attention. For a long time he could not tell what it was, but it looked to him like a big black box. So he got a long pole and reached out towards the box and managed to draw it within reach just above the big wheel. It was fortunate he saved it when he did, for in another moment it would have gone over the wheel and been dashed to pieces far below. When the miller had pulled the floating object upon the bank, he found it really was a box the lid being fastened tight with a strong cord. So he lifted it carefully and carried it into the mill-house, and then he placed it upon the floor while he lighted a candle. Then he cut the cord and opened the box, and, behold, a little babe lay within it, sweetly sleeping upon a pillow of down. The miller was so surprised that he stopped singing and gazed with big eyes at the beautiful face of the little stranger. And while he gazed, its eyes opened two beautiful pleading blue eyes, and the little one smiled and stretched out her arms toward him. Well, well, said the miller, where on earth did you come from? The baby did not reply, but she tried to and made some soft little noises that sounded like the cooing of a pigeon. The tiny arms were still stretched upwards, and the miller bent down and tenderly lifted the child from the box and placed her upon his knee. And then he began to stroke the soft silken ringlets that clustered around her head and to look upon her wonderingly. The baby leaned against his breast and fell asleep again, and the miller became greatly troubled, for he was unused to babies and did not know how to handle them or care for them. 
But he sat very still until the little one awoke, and then, thinking it must be hungry, he brought some sweet milk and fed her with a spoon. The baby smiled at him and ate the milk as if it liked it, and then one little dimpled hand caught hold of the miller's whiskers and pulled sturdily, while the baby jumped its little body up and down and cooed its delight. Do you think the miller was angry? Not a bit of it. He smiled back into the laughing face and let her pull his whiskers as much as she liked, for his whole heart had gone out to this little waif that he rescued from the river, and at last the solitary man had found something to love. The baby slept that night in the miller's own bed, snugly tucked in beside the miller himself, and in the morning he fed her milk again and then went out to work, singing more merrily than ever. Every few minutes he would put his head into the room where he had left the child to see if it wanted anything. And if it cried even the least bit, he would run in and take it in his arms and soothe the little girl until she smiled again. That first day the miller was fearful someone would come and claim the child. But when evening came without the arrival of any stranger, he decided the baby had been cast adrift and now belonged to nobody but him. I shall keep her as long as I live, he thought, and never will we be separated for even a day, for now that I have found someone to love, I could not bear to let her go again. He cared for the waif very tenderly, and as the child was strong and healthy, she was not much trouble to him, and to his delight grew bigger day by day. The country people were filled with surprise when they saw the child in the mill-house, and wondered where it came from, but the miller would answer no questions. And as year after year passed away, they forgot to inquire how the child came there, and looked upon her as the miller's own daughter. She grew to be a sweet and pretty child, and was the miller's constant companion. She called him Papa, and he called her Natalie, because when he found her upon the water, the country people called her the Maid of the Mill. The miller worked harder than ever before, for now he had to feed and clothe the little girl, and he sang from morn till night, so joyous was he, and still his song was, I care for nobody, no, not I, since nobody cares for me. One day, while he was singing this, he heard a sob beside him and looked down to see Natalie weeping. What is it, my pet? he asked anxiously. Oh, Papa, she answered, why do you sing that nobody cares for you when you know I love you so dearly? The miller was surprised, for he had sung the song so long he had forgotten what the words meant. "'Do you indeed love me, Natalie?' he asked. "'Indeed, indeed, you know I do,' she replied. "'Then,' said the miller, with a happy laugh, as he bent down and kissed the tear-stained face, "'I shall change my song.' And after that he sang, "'I love sweet Natalie, that I do, for Natalie she loves me.' The years passed away, and the miller was very happy. Natalie grew to be a sweet and lovely maid, and she learned to cook the meals and tend the house, and that made it easier for the miller, for now he was growing old. One day, the young squire who lived at the great house on the hill came past the mill and saw Natalie sitting in the doorway, her pretty form framed in the flowers that climbed around and over the door. And the squire loved her after that first glance, for he saw that she was as good and innocent as she was beautiful. The miller, hearing the sound of voices, came out and saw them together, and at once he became very angry, for he knew that trouble was in store for him, and he must guard his treasure very carefully if he wished to keep her with him. The young squire begged very hard to be allowed to pay court to the maid of the mill, but the miller ordered him away, and he was forced to go. Then the miller saw there were tears in Natalie's eyes, and that made him still more anxious, for he feared the mischief was already done. Indeed, in spite of the miller's watchfulness, the squire and Natalie often met and walked together in the shady lanes or upon the green banks of the river. It was not long before they learned to love one another very dearly, and one day they went hand in hand to the miller and asked his consent that they should wed. "'What will become of me?' asked the miller with a sad heart. "'You shall live in the great house with us,' replied the squire, "'and never again need you labor for bread.' But the old man shook his head. A miller I have lived, quoth he, and a miller will I die. But tell me, Natalie, are you willing to leave me? The girl cast down her eyes and blushed sweetly. I love him, she whispered, and if you separate us, I shall die. Then, said the miller, kissing her with a heavy heart, go, and may God bless you. So Natalie and the squire were wed, and lived in the great house, and the very day after the wedding she came walking down to the mill in her pretty new gown to see the miller. But as she drew near, she heard him singing, as was his wont, and the song he sung she had not heard since she was a little girl, for this was it. 
I care for nobody, no, not I, since nobody cares for me. She came up softly behind him and put her arms around his neck. Papa, she said, you must not sing that song. Natalie loves you yet and always will while she lives, for my new love is complete in itself and has not robbed you of one bit of the love that has always been your very own. The miller turned and looked into her blue eyes and knew that she spoke truly. Then I must learn a new song again, he said, for it is lonely at the mill and singing makes the heart lighter. But I will promise that never again, till you forget me, will I sing that nobody cares for me. And the miller did learn a new song and sang it right merrily for many years, for each day Natalie came down to the mill to show that she had not forgotten him. End of the Jolly Miller This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Cynthia Lyons, Naperville, Illinois. Little Man and His Little Gun from Mother Goose in Prose by L. Frank Baum. There was a little man, and he had a little gun, and the bullets were made of lead, lead, lead. He went to the brook and shot a little duck, and the bullet went right through its head, head, head. There was once a little man named Jimson, who had stopped growing when he was a boy and never started again. So, although he was old enough to be a man, he was hardly big enough, and had he not owned a bald head and gray whiskers, you would certainly have taken him for a boy whenever you saw him. This little man was very sorry he was not bigger, and if you wanted to make him angry, you had but to call attention to his size. He dressed just as big men do, and wore a silk hat and a long-tailed coat when he went to church, and a cap and top boots when he rode horseback. He walked with a little cane, and had a little umbrella made to carry when it rained. In fact, whatever other men did, this little man was anxious to do also. And so it happened that when the hunting season came around, and all the men began to get their guns ready to hunt for snipe and duck. Mr. Jimson also had a little gun made, and determined to use it as well as any of them. When he brought it home and showed it to his wife, who was a very big woman, she said, Jimson, you'd better use bullets made of bread, and then you won't hurt anything. "'Nonsense, Joan,' replied the little man. "'I shall have bullets made of lead, just as other men do, "'and every duck I see I shall shoot and bring home to you.' "'I'm afraid you won't kill many,' said Joan. "'But the little man believed he could shoot with the best of them. "'So the next morning he got up early and took his little gun "'and started down to the brook to hunt for duck.' It was scarcely daybreak when he arrived at the brook, and the sun had not yet peeped over the eastern hilltops. But no duck appeared anywhere in sight, although Mr. Jimson knew this was the right time of day for shooting them. So he sat down beside the brook and begun watching, and before he knew it he had fallen fast asleep. By and by he was awakened by a peculiar noise. Quack, quack, quack sounded in his ears, and looking up he saw a pretty little duck swimming in the brook and popping its head under the water in search of something to eat. The duck belonged to Johnny Sprigg, who lived a little way down the brook, but the little man did not know this. He thought it was a wild duck, so he stood up and carefully took aim. I'm afraid I can't hit it from here, he thought, 
so I'll just step up on that big stone in the brook and shoot from there. So he stepped out upon the stone and took aim at the duck again and fired the gun. The next minute the little man had tumbled head over heels into the water, and he nearly drowned before he could scramble out again, for not being used to shooting, the gun had kicked or recoiled and had knocked him off the round stone where he had been standing. When he had succeeded in reaching the bank, he was overjoyed to see that he had shot the duck, which lay dead upon the water a short distance away. The little man got a long stick, and reaching it out, drew the dead duck to the bank. Then he started joyfully homeward to show the prize to his wife. "'There, Joan,' he said as he entered the house, "'is a nice little duck for our dinner. "'Do you now think your husband cannot shoot?' "'But there's only one duck,' remarked his wife, "'and it's very small. "'Can't you go and shoot another? "'Then we shall have enough for dinner.' "'Yes, of course I can shoot another,' said the little man proudly. You make a fire and get the pot boiling, and I'll go for another duck. You'd better shoot a drake this time, said Joan, for drakes are bigger. She started to make the fire, and the little man took his gun and went to the brook. But not a duck did he see, nor drake neither, and so he was forced to come home without any game. "'There's no use cooking one duck,' said his wife. "'So we'll have pork and beans for dinner, "'and I'll hang the little duck in the shed. "'Perhaps you'll be able to shoot a drake tomorrow, "'and then we'll cook them both together.' "'So they had pork and beans, "'to the great disappointment of Mr. Jimson, "'who had expected to eat duck instead.' And after dinner the little man lay down to take a nap, while his wife went out to tell the neighbors what a great hunter he was. The news spread rapidly through the town, and when the evening paper came out, the little man was very angry to see this verse printed in it. There was a little man, and he had a little gun, and the bullets were made of lead, lead, lead. He went to the brook and shot a little duck, and the bullet went right through its head, head, head. He carried it home to his good wife Joan, and bade her a fire to make, 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 while he went to the brook where he shot the little duck and tried for to shoot the drake, drake, drake. "'There's no use putting it into the paper,' exclaimed the little man, much provoked. And Mr. Breyer, the editor, is probably jealous because he himself cannot shoot a gun. Perhaps people think I can't shoot a drake, but I'll show them tomorrow that I can. So the next morning he got up early again and took his gun and loaded it with bullets made of lead. Then he said to his wife, What does a drake look like, my love? Why, she replied, it's much like a duck, only it has a curl on its tail and red on its wing. All right, he answered. I'll bring you home a drake in a short time, and today we shall have something better for dinner than pork and beans. When he got to the brook, there was nothing in sight, so he sat down on the bank to watch and again fell fast asleep. Now Johnny Sprigg had missed his little duck, and knew someone had shot it, so he thought this morning he would go to the brook and watch for the man who had killed the duck, and make him pay a good price for it. Johnny was a big man, whose head was very bald. Therefore he wore a red curly wig to cover his baldness and make him look younger. When he got to the brook he saw no one about and so he hid in a clump of bushes. After a time the little man woke up, and in looking around for the drake, he 
he saw Johnny's red wig sticking out of the top of the bushes. That is surely the drake, he thought, for I can see a curl in something red. And the next minute, bang, went the gun, and Johnny Sprigg gave a great yell and jumped out of the bushes. As for his beautiful wig, it was shot right off his head and fell into the water of the brook a good ten yards away. "'What are you trying to do?' he cried, shaking his fist at the little man. "'Why, I was only shooting at the drake,' replied Jimson, "'and I hit it, too, for there it is in the water.' "'That's my wig, sir,' said Johnny Sprigg, "'and you shall pay for it, or I'll have the law on you. "'Are you the man who shot the duck here yesterday morning?' "'I am, sir,' answered the little man, proud that he had shot something beside a wig. "'Well, you shall pay for that also,' said Mr. Sprigg, "'for it belonged to me, and I'll have the money or I'll put you in jail.' The little man did not want to go to jail, so with a heavy heart he paid for the wig and the duck and then took his way sorrowfully homeward. He did not tell Joan of his meeting with Mr. Sprigg. He only said he could not find a drake. But she knew all about it when the paper came out, for this is what it said on the front page. There was a little man, and he had a little gun, and the bullets were made of lead, lead, lead. He shot Johnny Sprigg through the middle of his wig, and knocked it right off from his head, head, head. The little man was so angry at this, and at the laughter of all the men he met, that he traded his gun off for a lawnmower, and resolved never to go hunting again. He had the little duck he had shot made into a pie, and he and Joan ate it, but he did not enjoy it very much. This duck cost me twelve dollars, he said to his loving wife, for that is the sum Johnny Sprigg made me pay, and it's a very high price for one little duck. Don't you think so, Joan? End of Little Man and His Gun A LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hickory Dickory Dock from Mother Goose in Prose by L. Frank Baum. Hickory Dickory Dock, the mouse ran up the clock. The clock struck one, the mouse ran down. Hickory Dickory Dock. Within the hollow wall of an old brick mansion, away up near the roof, there lived a family of mice. It was a snug little house, pleasant and quiet, and as dark as any mouse could desire. Mamma Mouse liked it, because, as she said, the draught that came through the rafters made it cool in summer, and they were near enough to the chimney to keep warm in winter time. Besides the Mamma Mouse, there were three children, named Hickory and Dickory and Doc. There had once been a Papa Mouse as well, but while he was hunting for food one night, he saw a nice piece of cheese in a wire box, and attempted to get it. The minute he stuck his head into the box, however, it closed with a snap that nearly cut his head off. And when Mamma Mouse came down to look for him, he was quite dead. Mamma Mouse had to bear her bitter sorrow all alone, for the children were too young at that time to appreciate their loss. She felt that people were cruel to kill a poor mouse for wishing to get food for himself and his family. There is nothing else for a mouse to do but take what he can find, for mice cannot earn money as people do, and they must live in some way. But Mamma Mouse was a brave mouse, and knew that it was now her duty to find food for her little ones. 
so she dried her eyes and went bravely to work gnawing through the baseboard that separated the pantry from the wall. It took her some time to do this, for she could only work at night. Mice like to sleep during the day and work at night when there are no people around to interrupt them, and even the cat is fast asleep. Some mice run about in the daytime, but they are not very wise mice who do this. At last Mamma Mouse gnawed a hole through the baseboard large enough for her to get through into the pantry, and then her disappointment was great to find the bread jar covered over with a tin pan. How thoughtless people are to put things where a hungry mouse cannot get at them, said Mamma Mouse to herself with a sigh. But just then she espied a barrel of flour standing upon the floor, and that gave her new courage for she knew she could easily gnaw through that, and the flour would do to eat just as well as the bread. It was now nearly daylight, so she decided to leave the attack upon the flour barrel until the next night, and gathering up the children a few crumbs that were scattered about, she ran back into the wall and scrambled up to her nest. Hickory and Dickory and Doc were very glad to get the crumbs, for they were hungry, and when they had breakfasted, they all curled up alongside their mother and slept soundly throughout the day. "'Be good children,' said Mamma Mouse the next evening, as she prepared for her journey to the pantry, "'and don't stir out of your nest till I come back. I am in hopes that after tonight we shall not be hungry for a long time, as I shall gnaw a hole in the back of the flour barrel where it will not be discovered.' She kissed each one of them good-bye, and ran down the wall on her errand. When they were left alone, Hickory wanted to go to sleep again. But little Doc was wide awake, and tumbled around so in the nest that his brothers were unable to sleep. "'I wish I could go with Mother some night,' said Doc. "'It's no fun to stay here all the time.' "'She will take us when we are big enough,' replied Dickory. "'We are big enough now,' declared Doc. "'And if I knew my way, I would go out into the world and see what it looks like.' "'I know a way out,' said Hickory. "'But Mamma wouldn't like it if we should go without her permission.' "'She needn't know anything about it,' declared the naughty Doc. "'For she will be busy at the flour-barrel all the night. "'Take us out for a little walk, Hick, if you know the way.' "'Yes, do,' urged Dickory. "'Well,' said Hickory, "'I'd like a little stroll myself. "'So if you'll promise to be very careful "'and not get into any mischief, "'I'll take you through the hole that I have discovered.' "'So the three little mice started off, "'with Hickory showing the way, "'and soon came to a crack in the wall. "'Hickory stuck his head through, "'and finding everything quiet, for the family of people that lived in the house were fast asleep. He squeezed through the crack, followed by his two brothers. Their little hearts beat very fast, for they knew if they were discovered they would have to run for their lives. But the house was so still they gained courage and crept along over a thick carpet until they came to a stairway. "'What shall we do now?' whispered Hickory to his brothers. "'Let's go down,' replied Doc. "'So, very carefully, they descended the stairs "'and reached the hallway of the house. "'And here they were very much surprised by all they saw. "'There was a big rack for hats and coats, "'and an umbrella stand, and two quaintly carved chairs, "'and most wonderful of all, a tall clock, that stood upon the floor and ticked out the minutes in a grave and solemn voice. When the little mice first heard the ticking of the clock, they were inclined to be frightened, and huddled close together upon the bottom stair. "'What is it?' asked Dickory in an awed whisper. "'I don't know,' replied Hickory, who was himself rather afraid. "'Is it alive?' asked Doc. "'I don't know,' again answered Hickory. "'Then, 
seeing that the clock paid no attention to them, but kept ticking steadily away, and seemed to mind its own business, they plucked up courage and began running about. Presently, Dickory uttered a delightful squeal that brought his brothers to his side. There, in a corner, lay nearly half of a bun which little May had dropped when the nurse carried her upstairs to bed. It was a great discovery for the three mice, and they ate heartily until the last crumb had disappeared. "'This is better than a cupboard or a pantry,' said Doc, when they had finished their supper." "'and I shouldn't be surprised if there were plenty more good things around "'if we only hunt for them.' "'But they could find nothing more, "'for all the doors leading into the hall were closed, "'and at last Doc came to the clock and looked at it curiously. "'It doesn't seem to be alive,' he thought, "'although it does make so much noise. "'I'm going behind it to see what I can find.' He found nothing except a hole that led to inside of the clock, and into this he stuck his head. He could hear the ticking plainer than ever now, but looking way up to the top of the clock, he saw something shining brightly, and thought it must be good to eat, if he could only get at it. Without saying anything to his brothers, Doc ran up the sides of the clock until he came to the works and he was just about to nibble at a glistening wheel to see what it tasted like, when suddenly, bang, went the clock. It was one o'clock, and the clock had only struck the hour, but the great gong was just beside Doc's ear, and the noise nearly deafened the poor little mouse. He gave a scream of terror and ran down the clock as fast as he could go. When he reached the hall, he heard his brothers scampering up the stairs, and after them he ran with all his might. It was only when they were safe in their nest again that they stopped to breathe, and their little hearts beat fast for an hour afterward, so great had been their terror. When Mamma Mouse came back in the morning, bringing a quantity of nice flour with her for breakfast, they told her of their adventure. She thought they had been punished enough already for their disobedience, so she did not scold them, but only said, "'You see, my dears, your mother knew best when she told you not to stir from the nest. Children sometimes think they know more than their parents, but this adventure should teach you always to obey your mother. The next time you run away, you may fare worse than you did last night. Remember your poor father's fate.' But Hickory and Dickory and Doc did not run away again. End of Hickory Dickory Doc This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barbara Wedge, Richmond, Virginia. Little Bo Peep from Mother Goose in Prose by L. Frank Baum. On the beautiful, undulating hills of Sussex feed many flocks of sheep, which are tended by many shepherds and shepherdesses, and one of these flocks used to be cared for by a poor woman who supported herself and her little girl by this means. They lived in a small cottage, nestled at the foot of one of the hills, and each morning the mother took her crook and started out with her sheep, that they might feed upon the tender, juicy grasses with which the hills abounded. The little girl usually accompanied her mother, and sat by her side upon the grassy mounds, and watched her care for the ewes and lambs, so that in time she herself grew to be a very proficient shepherdess. So when the mother became too old and feeble to leave her cottage, little Bo Peep, as she was called, decided that she was fully able to manage the flocks herself. She was a little mite of a child, with flowing nut-brown locks, and big gray eyes that charmed all who gazed into their innocent depths. She wore a light gray frock, 
fastened about the waist with a pretty pink sash, and there were white ruffles around her neck and pink ribbons in her hair. All the shepherds and shepherdesses upon the hills, both young and old, soon came to know little Bo Peep very well indeed, and there were many willing hands to aid her if, which was not often, she needed their assistance. Bo Peep usually took her sheep to the side of a high hill above the cottage, and allowed them to eat the rich grass while she herself sat upon a mound and, laying aside her crook and her broad straw hat with its pink ribbons, devoted her time to sewing and mending stockings for her aged mother. One day, while thus occupied, she heard a voice behind her say, "'Good morning, little Bo Peep!' and looking up the girl saw a woman standing near her and leaning upon a short stick. She was bent nearly double by weight of many years, her hair was white as snow and her eyes as black as coals. Deep wrinkles seamed her face and hands, while her nose and chin were so pointed that they nearly met. She was not pleasant to look upon, but Bo Peep had learned to be polite to the aged, so she answered sweetly. "'Good morning, mother. Can I do anything for you?' "'No, dearie,' returned the woman in a cracked voice. "'But I will sit by your side and rest for a time.' The girl made room on the mound beside her, and the stranger sat down and watched in silence the busy finger sew up the seams of the new frock she was making. By and by the woman asked, "'Why do you come out here to sew?' "'Because I am a shepherdess,' replied the girl. "'But where is your crook?' "'On the grass beside me.' "'And where are your sheep?' Bo Peep looked up and could not see them. "'They must have strayed over the top of the hill,' she said, "'and I will go and seek them.' "'Do not be in a hurry,' croaked the old woman. "'They will return presently without your troubling to find them.' "'Do you think so?' asked Bo Peep. "'Of course. Do not the sheep know you?' Oh, yes, they know me every one. And do not you know the sheep? I can call every one by name, said Bo Peep confidently, for though I am so young a shepherdess, I am fond of my sheep and know all about them. The old woman chuckled softly, as if the answer amused her, and replied, No one knows all about anything, my dear. But I know all about my sheep, protested little Bo Peep. Do you indeed? Then you are wiser than most people, and if you know all about them, and you also know they will come home of their own accord, and I have no doubt they will all be wagging their tails behind them as usual. Oh, said little Bo Peep in surprise, do they wag their tails? I never noticed that. Indeed, exclaimed the old woman. Then you are not very observing for one who knows all about sheep. "'Perhaps you have never noticed their tails at all.' "'No,' answered Bo Peep thoughtfully. "'I don't know that I ever have.' The woman laughed so hard at this reply that she began to cough, and this made the girl remember that her flock had strayed away. "'I really must go and find my sheep,' she said, rising to her feet, "'and then I shall be sure to notice their tails and see if they wag them.' "'Sit still, my child,' said the old woman. I am going over the hilltop myself, and I will send the sheep back to you. So she got upon her feet, and began climbing the hill, and the girl heard her saying as she walked away, Little Bo Peep has lost her sheep, and doesn't know where to find them. But leave them alone, and they'll come home, all wagging their tails behind them. Little Bo Peep sat still, and watched the old woman toil slowly up the hillside, and disappear over the top. By and by, she thought, very soon I shall see the sheep coming back. But time passed away, and still the errant flock failed to make its appearance. Soon the head of the little shepherdess began to nod, and presently, still thinking of her sheep, little Bo Peep fell fast asleep, and dreamt she heard them bleeding. But when she awoke, she found it a joke, for still they were a-fleeting. The girl now became quite anxious, and wondered why the old woman had not driven her flock over the hill. But as it was now time for luncheon, she opened her little basket and ate of the bread and cheese and cookies she had brought with her. After she had finished her meal and taken a drink of cool water from a spring nearby, she decided she would not wait any longer. 
So up she took her little crook, determined for to find them, and began climbing the hill. When she got to the top there was never a sight of sheep about, only a green valley and another hill beyond. Now really alarmed for the safety of her charge, Bo Peep hurried into the valley and up the farther hillside. Panting and tired, she reached the summit and, pausing breathlessly, gazed below her. Quietly feeding upon the rich grass was her traunt flock, looking as peaceful and innocent as if it had never strayed away from its gentle shepherdess. Bo Peep uttered a cry of joy and hurried toward them, but when she came near she stopped in amazement and held up her little hands with a pretty expression of dismay. She had found them indeed, but it made her heart bleed, for they had left their tails behind them. Nothing was left to each sheep but a wee little stump where a tail should be, and little Bo Peep was so heartbroken that she sat down beside them and sobbed bitterly. But after a while the tiny maid realized that all her tears would not bring back the tails to her lambkins. So she plucked up courage and dried her eyes, and arose from the ground just as the old woman hobbled up to her. "'So you have found your sheep, dearie,' she said in her cracked voice. "'Yes,' replied little Bo Peep, with difficulty repressing a sob. "'But look, mother, they have all left their tails behind them.' "'Why, so they have!' exclaimed the old woman. And then she began to laugh as if something pleased her. "'What do you suppose has become of their tails?' asked the girl. "'Oh, someone has probably cut them off. They make nice tippets in winter time, you know.' And then she patted the child upon her head and walked away down the valley. Bo Peep was much grieved over the loss that had befallen her dear sheep, and so, driving them before her, she wandered around to see if by any chance she could find the lost tails. But soon the sun began to sink over the hilltops, and she knew she must take her sheep home before night overtook them. She did not tell her mother of her misfortune, for she feared the old shepherdess would scold her, and Bo Peep had fully decided to seek for the tales and find them before she related the story of their loss to anyone. Each day, for many days after that, little Bo Peep wandered about the hills seeking the tales of her sheep, and those who met her wondered what had happened to make the sweet little maid so anxious. But there is an end to all troubles, no matter how severe they may seem to be, and it happened one day as Bo Peep did stray onto a meadow hard by. There she espied their tails side by side, all hung on a tree to dry. The little shepherdess was overjoyed at this discovery, and reaching up her crook, she knocked the row of pretty white tails off the tree and gathered them up in her frock. But how to fasten them on to her sheep again was the question, and after pondering the matter for a time she became discouraged, and, thinking she was no better off than before the tails were found, she began to weep and to bewail her misfortune. But amidst her tears she bethought herself of her needle and thread. Why, she exclaimed, smiling again, I can sew them on, of course. Then she heaved a sigh and wiped her eye, and ran o'er hill and dale o and tried what she could, as a shepherdess should, to tack to each sheep its tail o. But the very first sheep she came to refused to allow her to sew on the tail, and ran away from her, and the others did the same, so that finally she was utterly discouraged. She was beginning to cry again, when the same old woman she had before met came hobbling to her side and asked, "'What are you doing with my cat-tails?' "'Your cat-tails,' replied Bo Peep in surprise, what do you mean? Why, these tails are all cut from white pussy cats, and I put them on the tree to dry. What are you doing with them? I thought they belonged to my sheep, answered Bo Peep sorrowfully. But if they are really your pussy cat tails, I must hunt until I find those that belong to my sheep. My dear, said the old woman, I have been deceiving you. You said you knew all about your sheep, and I wanted to teach you a lesson. For however wise we may be, no one in this world knows all about anything. Sheep do not have long tails. There is only a little stump to answer for a tail. Neither do rabbits have tails, nor bears, nor many other animals. And if you have been observing, 
You would have known all this when I said the sheep would be wagging their tails behind them, and then you would not have passed all those days in searching for what is not to be found. So now, little one, run away home, and try to be more thoughtful in the future. Your sheep will never miss the tails, for they never had them. And now, little Bo Peep no more did weep. My tale of tales ends here. Each cat has one, but sheep have none, which, after all, is queer. End of Little Bo Peep LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gemma Blythe. The story of Tommy Tucker. From Mother Goose in Prose. By L. Frank Baum. Little Tommy Tucker sang for his supper. What did he sing for? White bread and butter. How could he cut it without any knife? How could he marry without any wife? Little Tommy Tucker was a waif of the streets. He never remembered having a father or mother or anyone to care for him, and so he learned to care for himself. He ate whatever he could get, and slept wherever night overtook him, in an old barrel, a cellar, or when fortune favored him, he paid a penny for a cot in some rude lodging house. His life about the streets taught him early how to earn a living by doing odd jobs, and he learned to be sharp in his speech and wise beyond his years. One morning, Tommy crawled out from a box in which he had slept overnight and found that he was hungry. His last meal had consisted of a crust of bread, and he was a growing boy with an appetite. He had been unable to earn any money for several days, and this morning life looked very gloomy to him. He started out to seek for work or to beg a breakfast, but luck was against him and he was unsuccessful. By noon, he had grown more hungry than before, and stood before a bake shop for a long time, looking wistfully at the good things behind the window panes, and wishing with all his heart he had a halfpenny to buy a bun. And yet it was no new thing for little Tommy Tucker to be hungry, and he never thought of despairing. He sat down upon a curbstone and thought what was best to be done. Then he remembered he had frequently begged a meal at one of the cottages that stood upon the outskirts of the city, and so he turned his steps in that direction. I have had neither breakfast nor dinner, he said to himself, and I must surely find a supper somewhere, or I shall not sleep much tonight. It is no fun to be hungry. So he walked on until he came to a dwelling house, where a goodly company sat upon a lawn and beneath a veranda. It was a pretty place and was the home of a fat alderman who had been married that very day. The alderman was in a merry mood, and seeing Tommy standing without the gate, he cried to him, Come here, my lad, and sing us a song. Tommy at once entered the grounds and came to where the fat alderman was sitting beside his blushing bride. Can you sing? inquired the alderman. No, answered Tommy earnestly, but I can eat. Ho, ho! laughed the alderman that is a very ordinary accomplishment any one can eat if it please you sir you are wrong replied tommy for i have been unable to eat all day and why is that asked the alderman because i have had nothing to put in my mouth but now that i have met so kind a gentleman i am sure that i shall have a good supper the alderman laughed again at this shrewd answer and said you shall have supper no doubt but you must sing a song for the company first and so earn your food Tommy shook his head sadly. I do not know any song, sir, he said. The alderman called a servant and whispered something in his ear. The servant hastened away and soon returned, bearing upon a tray a huge slice of white bread and butter. White bread was a rare treat in those days, as nearly all the people ate black bread, baked from rye or barley flour. Now, said the alderman, placing the tray beside him, you shall have this slice of white bread and butter when you have sung us a song and complied with one condition. And what is that condition? asked Tommy. I will tell you when we have heard the song, replied the fat alderman, who had decided to have some amusement at the boy's expense. Tommy hesitated, but when he glanced at the white bread and butter, his mouth watered in spite of himself, and he resolved to compose a song, since he did not know how to sing any other. So he took off his cap and standing before the company he sang as follows a bumblebee lit on a hollyhock flower that was wet with the rain of a morning shower 
while the honey he sipped his left foot slipped and he couldn't fly again for half an hour good cried the alderman after the company had kindly applauded tommy i can't say much for the air nor yet for the words but it was not so bad as it might have been give us another verse so tommy pondered for a moment and then sang again a spider threw its web so high it caught on a moon in a cloudy sky the moon whirled round and down to the ground fell the web and captured a big blue fly why that is fine roared the fat alderman you improve as you go on so give us another verse i don't know any more said tommy and i am very hungry one more verse persisted the man and then you shall have the bread and butter upon the condition so tommy sang the following verse a big frog lived in a slimy bog and caught a cold in an awful fog the cold got worse the frog got hoarse till croaking he scared a pollywog you are quite a poet declared the alderman and now you shall have the white bread upon one condition what is it said tommy anxiously that you cut the slice into four parts but i have no nice remonstrated the boy but that is the condition insisted the alderman if you want the bread you must cut it surely you do not expect me to cut the bread without any knife said tommy why not asked the alderman winking his eye at the company because it cannot be done how let me ask you sir could you have married without any wife ha ha laughed the jolly alderman and he was so pleased with tommy's apt reply that he gave him the bread at once and a knife to cut it with thank you sir said tommy now that i have the knife it is easy enough to cut the bread and i shall now be as happy as you are with your beautiful wife the alderman's wife blushed at this and whispered to her husband the alderman nodded in reply and watched tommy carefully as he ate his supper when the boy had finished his bread which he did very quickly you may be sure the man said how would you like to live with me and be my servant little tommy tucker had often longed for just such a place where he could have three meals each day to eat and a good bed to sleep in at night so he answered i should like it very much sir so the alderman took tommy for his servant and dressed him in a smart livery and soon the boy showed by his bright ways and obedience that he was worthy any kindness bestowed upon him he often carried the alderman's wig when his master attended the town meetings and the mayor of the city who was a good man was much taken with his intelligent face so one day he said to the alderman i have long wanted to adopt a son for i have no children of my own but i have not yet been able to find a boy to suit me that lad of yours looks bright and intelligent and he seems a well-behaved boy into the bargain he is all that you say returned the alderman and would be a credit to you should you adopt him but before i adopt a son continued the mayor i intend to satisfy myself that he is both wise and shrewd enough to make good use of my money when i am gone no fool will serve my purpose therefore i shall test the boy's wit before i decide that is fair enough answered the alderman but in what way will you test his wit bring him to my house to-morrow and you shall see said the mayor so the next day the alderman followed by tommy and a little terrier dog that was a great pet of his master went to the grand dwelling of the mayor the mayor also had a little terrier dog which was very fond of him and followed him wherever he went when tommy and the alderman reached the mayor's house the mayor met them at the door and said tommy i am going up the street and the alderman is going in the opposite direction i want you to keep our dogs from following us but you must not do it by holding them very well sir replied tommy and as the mayor started one way and the alderman the other he took out his handkerchief and tied the tails of the two dogs together of course each dog started to follow its master but as they were about the same size and strength and each pulled in a different direction the result was that they remained in one place and could not move either one way or the other that was well done said the mayor coming back again but tell me can you put my cart before my horse and take me for a ride certainly sir replied tommy and going to the mayor's stable he put the harness on the nag and then led him head first into the shafts instead of backing him into them as is the usual way after fastening the shafts to the horse he mounted upon the animal's back and away they started pushing the cart before the horse that was easy said tommy if your honor will get into the cart i'll take you to ride 
but the mayor did not ride, although he was pleased at Tommy's readiness in solving a difficulty. After a moment's thought, he bade Tommy follow him into the house, where he gave him a cupful of water, saying, Let me see you drink up this cup of water. Tommy hesitated a moment, for he knew the mayor was trying to catch him. Then, going to a corner of the room, he set down the cup and stood upon his head in the corner. He now carefully raised the cup to his lips and slowly drank the water until the cup was empty. After this, he regained his feet, and bowing politely to the mayor, he said, The water is drunk up, your honor. But why did you stand on your head to do it? inquired the alderman, who had watched the act in astonishment. Because otherwise I would have drunk the water down and not up, replied Tommy. The mayor was now satisfied that Tommy was shrewd enough to do him honor. So he immediately took him to live in the great house as his adopted son, and he was educated by the best masters the city afforded. And Tommy Tucker became, after years, not only a great, but a good man, and before he died was himself mayor of the city, and was known by the name of Sir Thomas Tucker. End of the story of Tommy Tucker